Thank you so much. I'm David Corrin. I'm a PhD student from Leiden University and I'm engaged with contested heritage in post-colonial cities. And thank you, by the way, for sitting here now still at this time of the day. Um, cities have been associated with uh, suppression and terror since antiquity. They can be the seat of an authoritarian uh, and repressive regime. <coughs> think of the difference between the Greek city-states of Sparta and Athens. So there can be a strong associative relation between the city and its political signature. Daniel Bell and Efren de Chalie researched this topic in their book, The Spirit of Cities, where they define a spirit or ethos for various rural cities. But more authors wrote about the subject, about the relation between uh, urbanism and dictatorship. <coughs> in popular culture, we highly, highly associate cities with dynamics, hence its connection with strength, force and power, and also the use or abuse of it. On the one hand, cities are the focal point for civilization, but at the same time, they mirror the future. <coughs> and depending on your worldview, cities can be heavens of freedom and prosperity, but also tightly controlled microcosms, like Eloise Huxley's Brave New World or Josh Orwell's 1984. And there's also a wide range of studies about urban landscapes dating from fascist or communist rule. Think of the Esposizione Universale di Roma, uh, the Ur in Rome, the city quarter, but also socialist cities like Volgograd and Pyongyang. However, the city is not always an innocent vehicle for the ruling powers. It can also facilitate terror by its architecture, its spatial planning, and its infrastructure, simply because it can reflect the ruler's will and vision to shape the future and the proposed ideal society. It can limit the free movement of people and products, so a city can be an author of an urban landscape that highly controls and regulates its inhabitants. An important example was East Berlin, where the Berlin Wall ensured that nobody could leave the city or the country without permission of the state to do so. And in case one would try to do so without it, one would be shot. And the wall also prevented contacts in the free exchange of ideas, which was considered as a bad thing anyway, since everybody had to stick to the communist ideology. The use of violence is an important factor in either speaking of an urban terror escape or simply totalitarian urban planning. The city of Bucharest in Romania uh, is maybe somewhere in between the definition, simply because some more people died who didn't want to leave their houses and apartment blocks during the brutal demolition of these uh, uh, places in the late 1980s to make place for the monstrous palace of Nicolae Ceausescu. But besides the limitation of a city, its architecture, we can also think of the spatial structure of a city. A city can be built up like a panopticon, where the control over the most important parts of a city can be facilitated from one central point. The model of an ideal prison can be transposed on a city. Um, an old <coughs> example is Paris, where urban planner Georges Eugène Haussmann, appointed during the dictatorial Second Empire, mid 19th century, um, both physically modernized city center, but also facilitated the control of the city, preventing social unrest and possible uprisings. A more recent example involves the Tibetan capital of Lhasa, uh, where the Chinese government demolished uh, in the recent years a big part of the medieval city and to control the population and to be able to suppress possible uprisings from native Tibetans from the start. So a rational urban layout can thus become one of the physical instruments to exercise power or even terror. But terror is actually more than just random violence to scare the population. It can be a systematic and suppressive way of manipulating and controlling the population in an extreme manner, making use of violence when necessary. If the population, for instance, would oppose a threat for the realization of the idolized society. To illustrate the various and interconnecting features of terror and its translation into urban design, we're going to have a look at Pretoria, the capital of South Africa, and for more than half a century, uh, the seat of some racist apartheid regime. And Pretoria actually shows that the city is not a dead element, but rather an author that controls and regulates the movement and behavior of the people living there, as far as they were allowed to live there. But for analyzing Pretoria, I used ideas of Mich uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault, who describes in his monumental Discipline and Punishment, 1975, the transition from body to soul to disciplining power. And he also identifies four different kind of power techniques that are still applicable today. I only briefly mentioned them, and I'll touch upon them later. The first one is spatial discipline of people and activities, but also he mentions practice of, with regulation, surveillance and monitoring. The third one is tactics, about separation and aggregation of individuals, 
And the last one is research, the individual as an analytical units. I think also of Google, Trace, Facebook, and Big Data. Pretoria is a city dating from the second half of the 19th century, founded by the Afrikaners, which are the descendants of the Dutch colonizers. The Dutch slash Afrikaners lived at the Cape in South Africa, but in the first decades of the 19th century, they decided to move inland to escape from British rule. And after two wars, the British conquered the two uh, Afrikaner republics, Transvaal and or in the, the South African Republic. And the British actually introduced the apartheid in the country. Um, but in one thing they failed, that was making South Africa into a settler colony. So therefore the Afrikaners stated the majority. And in 1948, they gained back power because they won the elections. And the Afrikaners um, uh, were very much of losing their cultural identity because they lost two wars against the British, they suffered in concentration camps, and they were also facing a big, growing black majority, a strong dif demographic change. So after 1948, an illustrious uh, set of Afrikaner prime ministers <coughs> came into power, and they started to introduce an astonishing and comprehensive range of laws under the umbrella of apartheid, and it was to safeguard their own cultural identity. And actually, it also gave the colonial inequality a solid legal base. Hendrik de Woot, right here in the middle, was the first minister for native affairs, and later on he also became prime minister himself. Uh, and he also can be seen as the architect of apartheid. But the key point of this philosophy uh, was inequality of the races and the need for separate developments. It was partly based on existing practice, but also based on the ideas that many Afrikaner students brought in from Germany when they studied over there, and they brought in the racial doctrines from the 1930s. But all these measures were not uh, uh, done voluntarily. They used terror for it, and used violence for it. And actually, we can think of three methods they used. We can speak of ideological terror, which can be emotionally violent, but especially the planological terror is very important, the terror of the petty apartheid, the small apartheid, the urban apartheid, and the grand apartheid, and also the physical uh, terror, of course, which was the, also not very important. We well, plotted these different kinds of terror on a map. This is the central downtown of Pretoria. The red areas, for instance, are the places where people were tortured and also were killed. Let's start with ideological terror. Um, when you go to Pretoria, the first monument you'll see is the Pioneer Monument. It's a very big, solid structure, Art Deco style, almost 50 meters high. And it was built in 1948 to commemorate um, the Pioneer Movement from 100 years ago. The Pioneer Movement, like the, the, the whites, uh, the, the Afrikaner people, going inland with their ox wagons to found uh, the city of Pretoria, for instance. According to the architects, this monument is to serve as a tangible tribute to a group of people who, through their stupendous effort, had laid the foundation for a white civilization to be built in the territory of Southern Africa. And to achieve this ideal, he had to tame nature, conquer the savages, and establish his states. And on their way inland, the pioneers fought many battles, for instance, against the Zulus, and uh, 200 pioneers were killed by the Zulus. And after uh, this uh, uh, little massacre, they swore revenge on the Bible. And uh, they asked God on the 16th of December 1838 to get revenge on the Zulus, um, to get victory over them. The next day, there was the Battle of the Blood River, and they slaughtered thousands and thousands of Zulus. And that eventually led to the foundation of many villages and cities, including Pretoria. When you go to the monuments, you see the um, Hall of Heroes, which has a very long bas which depicts um, uh, the different things that happened, like the killing of the white people and also the well, they killed for Zulus uh, later on the next day. But every year, a shaft of sunlight goes through the roof, goes to the hall, and it goes down there to the hall in the floor. And there we see the cenotaph, which is a symbolic resting place for 200 people that were killed uh, by the Zulus. And on the cenotaph uh, are the words, uh, we pledge ourselves to South Africa. And this is meant, um, uh, this, this actually, this text is a direct reference to the oath that the pioneers have drawn up. And the shaft of sunlight resembles the bond between heaven and earth, between the Lord, between God and his chosen people, the Afrikaner people. And they think that they got the guardianship over the black people by this shaft of sunlight every year. The monument is actually is less, is, is less uh, innocent than it might seem at first glance, because first you see a beautiful Art Deco structure. But the subtext is, people are not equal. 
And to emphasize that, very close to the monument is a small replica of a Zulu hut, and it really resembles the smallness of black tribal culture, the literal smallness. And also, anthropology was a very popular studies in the 1940s, 1950s in South Africa, because they wanted to divide the blacks into smaller units. So every black tribe was meticulously, meticulously studied about the language, the cultural practices, and many other small uh, things. So you did not have blacks anymore, but you had the Zulus, the Pendis, the Kosas, the, the Venda, the, uh, every, uh, the Twana, and, and, and so more. Um, so also think of Foucault again, uh, divide and conquer. Uh, small units of blacks are better to control than a big mass of people. Ideolo ideological terror you can also see it, uh, see it for instance, on the uh, former Ministry of Native Affairs on Main Street, Pretoria, a very important building, by the way, with culture of stereotyping of the blacks. Blacks sitting around in cooking pots, seated to the right under there, and also together with monkeys. And it really clarifies the white gaze on the black people in the first years of apartheid. Rather exotic creatures uh, who are close to nature and who are less developed. The Nationalist Party actually began to introduce a total of 148 laws in the Battle of Apartheid, and each law was to entrench the white supremacy. Discrimination already existed since 1600, when the advent of the Europeans in South Africa, but it got a legal solid base during the apartheid period. For instance, next year it was prohibited to have a mixed marriage. In 1950 onwards, it was prohibited to have sexual intercourse, with a punishment of more than five years if you were caught, for instance. And one of the most visible things was the Separate Amenities Act, in which stated that every aspect of life had to be separated racially. So there were separate beaches uh, for blacks and for whites, uh, separate telephone booths, separate buildings for uh, post offices, separate uh, benches in parks. Everything was, uh, had to be separated. And also every person, every citizen was classified as either European, which meant that you were white with other privileges, or black, colored or Asian, so non-European, with, with hardly any rights, limited rights, and they were not allowed to own land, for instance, or to vote. Here we see an example of post offices with a double entrance system and a uh, double circulation system uh, right under this Pretoria. The black entrance now is closed because you don't need it anymore after the transition. And very important as well was the urban apartheid. Um, in 1915 onwards, there was also spatial segregation with the past laws and the Group Area Acts. Every person over 16 had to carry a pass, which stated your race. Um, and it said also said it's, it's, it's meant that where you were allowed to be, where you were allowed to stay. Uh, and the Group Area Act forced non-Europeans to live in especially designated areas. And only blacks with, uh, with a job in a white area could stay in a white area. For instance, if you were a housemate, you had to work between 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the evening, you could stay there in a white area. But if you caught at 9 or 10 even, then you were uh, in big trouble. You could be sent to prison, and you could stay there for one, two, three, five days, one month. If nobody picked you up, you could stay there for the rest of your life, maybe, because you were just a number for the, for the prison system. And also, urban planning was very strict in a way that they uh, built the black townships uh, really far away from the white city center. So here we see a photo of Mamelodi, uh, which is the biggest uh, black township with almost uh, two million inhabitants these days. Um, it is built like more than 20 kilometers away from the city center. First they started to build roundables, but there were too many protests against it, so later on they decided, they decided to build more the residential barracks according to the will of the black African, or the black, uh, the black people. Remnants you can still see from the urban terror, like uh, these big uh, concrete poles, because these uh, black townships only had two, three, four roads going and going out. So the connection with the city was very, very bad. So it was easily to fence these places off from the rest of the city and the country. Also big lighting poles to illuminate the whole area if there was an uprising going on or start going to start. And this big hearth, well, it's only now in the museum, in Kaspir, it's called. It's possible to crush people, to crush houses and um, even houses and to shoot from the little narrow windows over there. Homelands were also very important uh, to create a white majority in South Africa because whites were bound to lose if they didn't control the growing black population. In total, 10 homelands were uh, 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 drawn up and they occupied around 30% of the territory, but more than half of the population were living in the homelands. And in a way, these homelands functioned as some kind of prison to the blacks they could not escape from. And on the first, uh, first sight, homelands have a lot to do with the uh, development of a city like Pretoria. But then again, it is very close to Pretoria. Actually, some suburbs are officially located in the homeland of Beputatwana, 
And here you see Baputa Tswana, just a variety of six different plots of lands in the northern part of the country, which is one of the ten homelands in total. And this was the homeland for the Tswana people, and even became officially independent in 1977. Um, the bad thing was, if you're going to live in the homeland, that you were deprived from your South African citizenship, you would lose it, and therefore also your wage would be lowered, because um, you would become a foreign laborer. But then again, it was one of the better functioning homelands, because Boputatswana contained Sun City, the biggest leisure landscape of apartheid. And the city was a place where you could see Hollywood stars, uh, like Tina Turner, Rod Stewart, or Queen. Uh, they would escape the cultural boycott in the 1980s. And also a place to go to prostitutes, to have sex with a black woman, for instance. And also, when you're a white tourist, you could go there on safari, to Pilanesberg. But even Pilanesberg is like a trauma escape for the black population, because it was actually black agricultural lands. It was just, uh, uh, but all the houses have to be, were demolished, people were expelled, and during Operation Genesis 1979, in one year, they imported more than 6,000 animals from the rest of Africa to create this pristine South African landscape as it was supposed to be. And as white think, this is real South Africa. Um, the fight and conquer. Even within a minority area like Baputaswana, they created minority places, like uh, some villages from the Dublin people. And here we see the village of Klipgat. And it's actually a model village dating from the drawing tables from apartheid, built in the 1950s, according to the um, white anthropologist thought that and how the Dublin should live and how their culture was actually. And he, to the right, you see that Dr. Ude Kuzel, who worked for the provincial government, and actually this was his invention, more or less. So this village looked like a golden cage for the people who did not voluntarily choose to live there. They were forced and were expelled from the city to live there in this small village. And in a way, it looks like some kind of uh, uh, human zoo, in a way, where white people go to see, to look at black children. How nice. But of course, all, every measurement were also taken with violence. Uh, and there were a lot of types of violence, domestic, the police, the police for enforcing the petty apartheid, the police for implementing the grand apartheid, you had the death penalty. Uh, you have, uh, Pretoria was the place where white people were sent to prison to if they were opposing the regime. There were centers of torture and also biological experiments took place in South Africa. And also it was a seat for the, um, uh, the terror abroad, which was an atomic program, the border wars and special hit squads. And dotted around the cities are many monuments which who refer to the, to the terror in the city, like armies, uh, monuments for the police and for the army, but also very notorious and dubious Kufuts, which was a hit squad that functioned in Angola and Namibia. They slaughtered hundreds and thousands of people. They burned down many villages uh, just because they were fighting communism in the 70s, and especially the 80s. Also very important was Vlakplaas, which was a, uh, the, the, um, um, the place for C1. Uh, and C1 was uh, a special unit for killing and torturing uh, black opponents of the apartheid regime. And was led by Mr. Eugene de Kock, or his nickname was Prime Evil. And he was also close and linked to Wouter Bazon uh, with the development of uh, biological and chemical weapons only to target black people with people with black skin. The white people should stay uh, outside of this, uh, the effect of the, the, the weapon. And also black victims would be uh, uh, black victims of interrogation at his farm uh, would be burned at the barbecue over there. Um, the prison was very important, of course, where the white people would send to, for instance, and also in the prison you have to the gallows. And this was the only place where people were sent to the gallows in Africa was Pretoria, because it was the capital. The gallows were demolished in 1996, um, but after three minutes later, 19, uh, sorry, in 2007. Uh, they decided that this place was so important for the uh, suffering of the black population that the gallows needed to be tr needed to be get needed to get reconstructed, and so they did. It took them almost ten years, and in 2016, the gallows were reopened as a museum in the prison by Mr. Pre Mr. by the President Jacob Zuma. Different places of torture, like the headquarters of the police, a very sinister building you could go in these days, uh, but also the the, the head, head office of the security police, which is an old Dutch building, by the way. And to the right, you see the building of the National Intelligence Service, which had grills on the top floors to prevent people jumping out of the windows during, inter during their, their interrogation. Well, after 1994, there was a transitional period, uh, with, the, uh, with, of course, Nelson Mandela being elected as president. And I could talk another hour about this area, about this uh, time, but I will do that. Some things that happened. Uh, there was a start, yet yeah, a start of the truth and reconciliation uh, uh, process, which has been very important, truth-finding process and they took some um, rather 
well, in a way, some superficial measurements, like changing the names of streets, for instance. But also, the city got a new name itself. Pretoria now is officially called Chwane, and uh, Pretoria is only used for the central business district, central business districts. But also, Pretoria was, or Chwane was enlarged. It now includes many um, uh, areas from Bulbudotswana. And that was to make and to create a black majority in the city, because it was solely a white city, actually. Also, narratives were revised in some museums, and also they created new monuments. And they started with parallel and dual narratives, but it does not really work, and I can come back to that later maybe on. But anyway, um, these were just measures, but then again, deep poverty and social inequality remains, and that was also caused by the terror of apartheid uh, politics. And that makes the city and this whole country, in a way, like a ticking time bomb. My conclusions. Uh, can we see a city as a terror scape? I would argue yes, because cities can have a highly associative relationship with terror. Cities can also facilitate terror by its architecture, but also by spatial structure, infrastructure. I did not touch a subject, I can also talk about it more longer. And also about host institutions for physical terror, for execution of terror. And planning actually has a very long lasting influence on future generations. You can maybe eradicate some physical remains of terror, but the planning part is very important. And don't focus only on visual aspects, but also look at the whole urban system, how it all functions. <coughs> and then again, it's also a possible goldmine for dark tourism, which is all side remark. But my two main remarks about this um, uh, topic is that uh, the power techniques of Michel Foucault are a very useful instrument to analyze the working of terror methods. And most important, in order to recover from a painful past, it is necessary to analyze the elements and structures that were implemented in the urban system to cause this terror. Otherwise, metaphorically speaking, uh, the perpetrator can stay on his pedestal. Thanks so much for your attention. <laughs>